All right. So, so let's begin our afternoon session. Our first speaker is 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 Alan Nishri from Tel Aviv University, and he will speak about outliers in weakly defined Coulomb type system. Alan, thank you. Uh, thanks for, uh, for the invitation. Uh, very glad for uh, the chance uh, to talk to you about uh, this work. Uh, so everything uh, is based on uh, joint work with uh, Rafael Boutez, uh, David Garcia Salada, and uh, Aaron Benman. Uh, a preliminary version appeared uh, on the archive uh, some time ago. Uh, I really hope uh, that uh, during this year sometime we will have the final version. Uh, so uh, the high dimensional aspect, I guess, of this talk is that we are talking about uh, particle systems uh, in the uh, limit of uh, many particles. Um, so I'll uh, give the sort of the general idea of uh, what I want to talk about uh, today. Um, so in general, we are the, we, this talk is about particle system or point processes in the language of probability. Uh, I will only consider the plane, although the question is interesting in uh, other dimensions as well. Uh, the number of particles uh, will go to infinity, so we will try to uh, uh, describe some limiting uh, point processes. Um, so the typical uh, systems uh, related to uh, a mark stock, for example, uh, if we take uh, a, a random matrix with the independent, uh, uh, let's say complex Gaussians, uh, then the eigenvalues uh, will satisfy the, the circular law. So you see that the eigenvalues will form a disk uh, in the limit, all of them will be inside this disk, and there will be a few uh, outliers. And the typical picture is this one, uh, but we are interested uh, in this in our study in, uh, in particle systems where you have many outliers. The, the picture is more looks something like this. So you have uh, many outliers, and some of them actually can be uh, quite far from the uh, main region, which is called uh, the droplet. Um, so you can ask uh, all kinds of questions. I will refer to some of them. Uh, one question that you can ask is, do you look very close to the boundary. Uh, you normalize the system to have to, uh, to live in a sort of typically in a fixed size disk, uh, and you add more and more particles. Uh, so the, there will be more and more particles next to the boundary. Then you can uh, blow up the system and try to describe uh, the picture that you see, this is, uh, was done in one dimension, also in two dimensions, in all kinds of contexts. Uh, I will talk a bit about this, but what is more interesting to us is actually uh, to forget what is going on inside as a droplet or the bulk, as it is called, and just look at the outliers. Uh, and we will see that uh, for the systems uh, that uh, I will talk about today, uh, actually something non-trivial happens. Uh, in the previous picture, if you just take the limit to infinity, there will be basically nothing outside uh, of the bulk. But uh, for our systems, actually, there will be something left uh, in the limit, which is interesting. This is uh, the outlier of the process. Um, so I will uh, describe actually two models uh, of such weakly confined particle systems with many outliers. Uh, the one of them. Uh, I show the pictures. This is a special case of a Coulomb gas at a special temperature, which is a, leads to a determinantal point processes. Uh, well, the, there is a sort of an external field. Uh, the external, as if you don't put any field, and then all the particles will run away to infinity. So you put some external field, but the field is sufficiently weak so that you will still see uh, outliers far away from where they're supposed to be. Uh, and the other uh, a kind of uh, model is are the zeros of uh, random linear combinations of uh, certain orthogonal polynomials, which you also see uh, the same uh, phenomena, which is surprising because this is uh, not a determinantal uh, process. Uh, what is interesting uh, to me is that uh, we find uh, a sort of a universality. We get uh, a similar point process in the limit, the Bergman point process, which I will talk about uh, later on. And it's uh, no, not only uh, that, it's a, uh, it shows a certain conformal invariance. Uh, 
So the process is also universal with, with respect to the, to the shape of the domain. So we, I, we, in particular, we'd be interested in uh, article systems where the bulk is not uh, radially symmetric. Uh, also, it's interesting to consider cases where the bulk is, uh, where, where we have uh, uh, points, outliers, which live in domains which are not, multi, are not simply connected. Uh, if here simply connected, we think of things uh, on the sphere. So, for example, uh, this uh, comp uh, the complement of the disk is also simply connected. Uh, and if there is time, I, uh, I will uh, talk a bit about this uh, additional uh, phenomenon you see here. And if time permits, I will uh, talk briefly about some ideas. Um, so. Let me first describe the first uh, type of uh, systems that we consider uh, very briefly. Um, so we have uh, n particles, um, let's say negative charge, you can think of them uh, as electrons, and they are, uh, in order to not to run to infinity, they, they are in some uh, system, uh, some uh, background, which is, uh, you can think of as positive charge. Uh, for us, it's important, actually, the strength of this, uh, of the interaction is important. This is kappa n. You can think of it as the, the number of particles with a positive charge, roughly. So we have to have kappa n sufficiently large to balance the negative charge of the n particles. Uh, so in two dimensions, the uh, uh, Coulomb interaction is uh, logarithmic. Um, and then we can uh, form a sort of a, an energy, the energy of the system, uh, if we denote the positions by uh, zj of the particles is uh, we have the sum of the logarithmic interaction between each of pair of particles, uh, and we have the, uh, the, ex the sum of the, of the external field at each of the points at times this, uh, the strength of the interaction, uh, which will be uh, important for us. Uh, the, the reason it's important is because uh, because uh, uh, the field here is very weak and uh, near infinity, so we need to choose this constant sufficiently large, so the whole thing will be uh, will we, will be able to dominate this uh, interaction between the points, so they will not uh, just run away to infinity. Um, so mathematically speaking, uh, we have uh, n uh, particles. Uh, we can think of them as a random vector. Uh, and they have the, the following joint density. Um, so we have in general this uh, beta parameter, which stands for temperature, most uh, accurately inverse temperature, but for us it will be fixed. Uh, and we have uh, the, the external field. Um, one uh, particular uh, example, you can think of it as a canonical example, although it's not uh, exactly fitting within the framework of what we're trying to do. Uh, is if we take uh, the external field to be just uh, mod z squared, this corresponds to having a uniform uh, background everywhere uh, in the plane of positive um, charge. Uh, and beta, the temperature uh, or inner temperature is, uh, is two. And uh, this is where uh, this corresponds to eigenvalues of random matrices. Uh, but the confinement here is very strong. We can think of it as the, the positive charge, but it's basically there is infinite positive charge, so the system is not even very physical. Uh, so it might make more sense to look at a, a physical system where the charge uh, is, uh, is finite. So that's the picture that we see uh, from the Ginebra ensemble before, and now we want to uh, cook up an example where we have uh, many outliers. Um, so I'll explain uh, um, uh, soon why uh, physically, physical explanation, why we have uh, U outliers, and then we, this will lead to how we uh, cook up examples where we have many of them. Um, so because of that, there is a strict, uh, uh, so kappa n uh, is a sort of the, the total charge. Uh, we have to put uh, extra uh, charge, so the system is not physically uh, neutral, we have to put a bit more uh, uh, charge because the, the field itself is, uh, is weak. Uh, so this will force us to choose kappa n uh, bigger, uh, strictly bigger than n uh, in our case. Okay, so it doesn't conform exactly with what we happen with the Ginebra ensemble. 
Um, what's known in general is the following, that uh, under very, very general conditions, if we look at the empirical measure, so we put the delta mass at each of the points and normalize, this thing will converge to some limiting measure. Uh, the support of the limiting measure is a, is a droplet where most of the particles uh, live uh, for finite n, and in the limit, uh, this is where you see the particles. Uh, it's a, a nice uh, compact set, so everything is, uh, is uh, bounded. Uh, you don't need to make many assumptions for this to be true. And the, the droplet, the, the thing that uh, identifies it is that if we have an external field uh, V, uh, then uh, the potential, in this case, we are two dimensions, so the logarithmic potential or uh, the electric potential of the point, if you want, it's, uh, it's equal up to a constant to the external field. Okay, so this is the picture that you see in the Geneva ensemble. So it's a radially symmetric. So I take a, a cut from the side. So the droplet, this is the, the cut of the, of the disk. And the field V is the quadratic. And the potential uh, U is quadratic. Here I uh, identified the constant to make it easier to see. Um, so the, the field is quadratic inside uh, the droplet, and then they separate. It grows logarithmically at infinity because um, it is, it's a logarithmic potential of a, of a probability measure. And so they separate at some point. And this thing, uh, this difference is the thing that really confines as a system very strongly because if you, the probability cost will be exponential in the sort of difference between this field and the potential. Uh, so it's very prohibitive to be very far away from the droplet. Uh, so they, that's why we don't see almost no particles uh, far away. So we, we want to cook up a system where we do see particles away. So one natural way to do it was to, to make the field attach the potential, okay? So this is where we have weak confinement, roughly speaking. It means that uh, the, the difference between these two it doesn't form a well, so doesn't the, this, they don't split outside of the droplet. Okay. The, the simplest way to cook this up is to start from an external field, which is given by a logarithmic potential of a probability measure. So we start from a fixed measure, a probability measure mu, and uh, which is nice enough, uh, so that the logarithmic potential will be nice. And we look at the logarithmic potential of that measure. Uh, in this case, we, uh, one can show that the limiting measure, so the limiting measure of the points will actually be the same as the probability measure that generates uh, the, the confinement, is the field. Uh, and uh, for us, uh, the, the choice of kappa will be important uh, that it will be between, uh, strictly bigger than n for the things to, be, to make sense uh, mathematically, otherwise uh, it, it will not converge. Uh, and we also want to restrict it to be at most n plus one. So a typical choice would be n plus uh, alpha, but uh, we are not restricted. We can choose anything. And the reason is that if we choose kappa n uh, bigger than that, uh, it definitely makes sense, but uh, already the limiting processes might be different. So I, I don't want to get into this uh, complications. And if we make kappa n sufficiently large, then we will already be back to strong confinement. So we also don't want to go there. Uh, so I mentioned some uh, uh, results here. Um, so we are in a sort of a restricted uh, region, which is also the most interesting between, because it's close to a charge balance between the negative and the positive charge. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, two, uh, two examples of two different measures. Uh, here we take a uniform measure on the circle, probability measure, and this is the process uh, uh, this uh, we can find the uh, Coulomb gas that we see. And here we take a uniform measure uh, on, the, on the disk. And we see already we have uh, outliers which are far away from the droplet. It's not like uh, the Gini Brown sample. Uh, if you want to ask questions, I will, uh, my voice will run out at some point. So take it into account. Um, Okay, so now we want to basically, th there are many outliers. We want to describe uh, what is going on with them. Um, 
So what process do we see? So we can ask all kinds of questions. So first of all, are there many particles outside? Uh, how many uh, are there depending on n? It's a bit delicate question because uh, we have to say what outside means. I will not be too specific. Maybe I will mention something. Um, do they have some uh, description in terms of the limiting point process? And how it depends on the choice of the measure we generate the process? Here it's important because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, so we can do two type, uh, several types of uh, limiting things. So we can here, for example, we see the points are uh, getting crowded more and more. So one thing we can do is to zoom in in a small box around this point, say, and describe the point process. Uh, but we do something different. We don't do any scaling. And we just look at the points, let's say, inside the disk here. We call them outliers. And then in the limit, we will see that there is a point process without doing any scaling. Okay, so this is uh, just a, a picture. So you, you will not be able to see here, I took a uniform measure on an ellipse. Uh, I ran uh, 100 simulations with the 200 particles each. So the, there is no way uh, point to point interaction. It's, I, I just, it's the superposition of all of the simulations, but we definitely see that there is a bulk with a huge number of points. So we, it's, 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 these, these are points. I didn't do uh, like an ellipse. It's, uh, there are so many points that you just see the ellipse. And we, but we see there is a significant number of outliers and they are far away. Um, so let me not uh, dwell too much on the details, but uh, everything uh, is dealing with the Coulomb gas is based on the fact that these point processes are determinantal, uh, meaning that the uh, K point correlations uh, given by uh, a formula of a determinant uh, with respect to some kernel. Uh, meaning that uh, all computation, at least in principle, can be done in terms of this, uh, of this uh, kernel that uh, determines the distribution of the process. Uh, in theory, uh, if we use uh, the general theory of determinant of point process, the distribution of number of points in, uh, in any domain uh, is just a sum of independent Bernoulli uh, zero one random variables. So in, in theory, you can do all kinds of computations. Uh, in practice, uh, the parameters of the Bernoulli random variables uh, are not uh, tractable unless the problem is radial. Uh, so so you, you need to find a different way to approach it. And uh, the way we, we, we are dealing with this is uh, reduce the problem of convergence of processes to study analytic properties of the kernels. Uh, so uh, what turns us to be is that uh, if we look at the kernels uh, that determine the uh, behavior of the process, if we can show convergence, uh, we need a, look, a locally uniform convergence, and then this means that we can identify uh, how the, to what the processes are converging to. So if we have a sequence of kernels, uh, there is also some background measure different from the other measures that I talked about before, so denoted by M. Uh, if they converge to some uh, Candidate, candidate kernel, then there is actually a point process corresponding to this, uh, to this limiting function, uh, and there is a convergence in distribution of the, uh, of the point processes to the limiting point process, so uh, all the statistics in the limit converge to the statistics of the limiting process. Okay, so we have to identify the kernels of uh, our finite processes, and then see if we can, uh, uh, can say anything about uh, a limit. Uh, for the n particles, we have an ex uh, a sort of explicit way to uh, describe the kernel. So it's uh, what we do is that uh, we look at the orthogonal polynomials, pk and n. Uh, so are, they are orthogonal with respect to the inner product in the space L2, uh, e to the minus kappa n v. V is uh, this external field which is determined by the uh, fixed probability measure. Uh, and then if we look at this expression, uh, this gives us uh, just the, 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 the determinantal kernel of the, of the point process corresponding to, uh, to the n particles. Okay, uh, one thing that's uh, to notice here, and it's actually important from the technical perspective, it's not unique. I mean, we can also always uh, add a phase here, and uh, this uh, turns out not to, to lead to the same process. And this is actually important uh, if you want to do a to show convergence, because sometimes if you just look at this expression as is, you cannot uh, obtain any type of convergence uh, because of the phase, things will just uh, run around. And if you correct the phase, you can obtain convergence. Okay, so I will denote this uh, points of this uh, particle system by this uh, uh, calligraphic X. 
And so this is the, the picture that we have in general. We have the admissible measures. Uh, I won't get into too many details, but we do need the uh, uh, analyticity. So we, what was important for us is not to restrict ourselves to radial things. So we have general shapes, but uh, we do need, uh, uh, roughly speaking, that the density will be uh, analytic and the boundary uh, will be uh, analytic. Um, and this is a, this is a sort of a, a snapshot of this uh, admissible measure. So it has a singular component here on the boundary of omega two, and here it has a, on the boundary of uh, omega one it has a singular component and also a component inside, and there's also component here outside. And so in general, we will have some outlier forces in this domain here, omega one, uh, which is not simply connected, and we also have an outlier forces here. Uh, in omega two, which is, is which is simply connected, okay, and there will also be the bulk uh, in the rest here, and also on this uh, singular part. Okay. And so we want to describe wh what's the limiting uh, processes uh, that we get. And so here it becomes more complicated. So. If we look at this picture, so there will be two processes, the process in omega one, which is not simply connected, uh, and the process in uh, omega two. So now I will just talk about uh, processes uh, in simply connected uh, domains where things are uh, somewhat uh, simpler. And I will choose uh, kappa n to be n plus one. So there is just uh, one extra positive charge compared to negative. And what we, what we can uh, say is that if we look at the uh, process of outliers, so those which are uh, uh, inside this uh, simply connected domain, which is in the complement of the support of the probability measure mu that we started with, then the, this, the process converge in distribution uh, to a Bellman point process, uh, which is uh, an unweighted uh, Process with the kernel, which is associated to uh, the kernel is associated uh, is the, the Bergman kernel, which I will describe shortly. Um, so uh, in the radial case, which was the motivation for this work, uh, there, there were actually no regularity assumptions at all, and with the same limiting uh, process. So it remains a good question: what are the exact conditions which we, which we lead to uh, this? Uh, Process. I think some conditions are probably do are needed uh, in the uh, in the non-radial case. But uh, so for now, I'm just hiding this under a nice probability measure. Um, but uh, what are the optimal conditions? This is not clear. Um, so now I want to describe a bit um, what this process is, and we'll see it's, uh, it has uh, very nice properties. Uh, but uh, for us, the, the, the first thing to notice is that in, on the right-hand side, so the left-hand side definitely depends on the, this measure mu, uh, which is the input uh, to the distribution of Xn here. Uh, but on the right-hand side, we see we get the Bergman process and it depends only on omega, on omega. So basically the process doesn't depend at all on the, uh, on the measure. It only depends on the, a shape of the of the region. Um, okay, so the, the Bergman kernel. Uh, this is a very short description. So we look at the Hilbert space of the L two functions, analytic functions inside this uh, simply connected domain omega. Uh, if we take uh, uh, this uh, phi n is any orthonormal basis that we choose for this a base, then the, the Bergman uh, kernel is just uh, the sum uh, that I write here. So of course, uh, this is not at clear at all how to choose an autonormal basis explicitly if we are given omega, but what turns out to be the case is that for the unit disk, we already know that uh, the monomials are uh, clearly orthogonal with respect to uh, L2 of the disk. Okay, so we can write out explicitly uh, what are the FL after we uh, autonormalize them, check, check, check the normalization. And once we write uh, here, we get a sort of a, a Taylor series in two variables because uh, the phi is really just uh, weighted monomials. And we get explicit expression 
for the Bagman kernel of the disk, which is very nice also. And the, the magic here is that there is a conformal invariance. So the Bergman uh, kernel of any uh, simply connected domain can be obtained by the Bergman kernel of the disk uh, by just by applying the conformal map from uh, this domain to the disk. So we, we map the points from omega to the disk, and then we can compute uh, the Bergman kernel in terms of the explicit Bergman kernel of the disk. This is the kind of magic that appears. And this implies another very nice uh, property of these processes. Not only they depend only on the shape of the, uh, of the component in the, in the complement of the support, but the process itself is conformally invariant. Okay? So if we map the process uh, of, a, of, a, of this general component omega uh, to the disk, we get a process with the same distribution as the process for the disk. So here I can show an example. So I took just the outliers uh, of the ellipse, and then I put them back with the conformal map uh, that maps the disk to the ellipse. And I don't know if you are convinced or not, but it sort of looked like a radially symmetric process uh, on the disk. It's actually, it's not the process. So here I'm cheating a bit because uh, numerically it's extremely difficult. Uh, it's not difficult to do the computation, the simulation for many particles, but it's, uh, the convergence is extremely slow. So it's easier to just do uh, many simulation for uh, smaller systems and just uh, superimpose them. Uh, but uh, still it uh, it's generates convincing pictures that's important for uh, presentations, I guess. Um, okay, so uh, we, we get here the, the, the two nice properties that the, the process depends only on the shape and not on the measure and that it's conformally invariant. Um, so that's the, the general picture. Uh, we have a process here, a process here, a process here. Uh, in this case, all of them are simply connected on the sphere. Uh, so they are... Uh, covered by the, uh, the theorem. Uh, this process also uh, appears, and this is uh, really relevant to what uh, I will talk about uh, later. The, it, it appears in, uh, in the case of the zeros of a certain uh, Gaussian analytic function. Uh, it was studied by Peres and Virag. So this is, uh, if you take the following uh, Taylor series, And the science of uh, IID a complex Gaussian. Uh, then uh, it's a pretty amazing fact that uh, the zeros of this uh, of this uh, uh, function, which is analytic inside the unit disk, uh, they form exactly this uh, Bergman point process. Uh, that I uh, talked about uh, before. Um, another question which is uh, natural to ask is uh, there is a known phenomenon in uh, Coulomb gas that uh, basically the, the bulk sort of a screen. So here the bulk is in blue. Uh, the bulk, uh, the particles arrange themselves in such a way that uh, the system will not see what happens uh, 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 what happens in the distances which are far. So we have this uh, sort of a isolated thing here from here and the, the, the bulk sort of isolates the system from each other. And uh, the question is whether, what can we say about this the outlier processes? What is the, the dependence between them, if any? And we, sh we show that they are independent. So uh, here I will state it just for the two simply connected dom uh, domains. It's not, uh, but it's generalized to other situations. So we can, uh, fix this two, think of this uh, two uh, components. Think of these two components, for example. And we consider the two uh, associated uh, outlier processes. Then these two processes converge to the respective uh, Bergman point processes, depending on the domain. Uh, and the processes in the limit are independent. Right. So this is exactly this uh, screening that Coulomb gas 
shows that the particles, uh, the, the bulk uh, separates sort of the, the behavior of two subsystems. This should be in principle true for any beta, but it's not really clear how to approach uh, the beta, even in, in one dimension. I'm not sure it's understood for this kind of problems and two dimension definitely it's not understood how to, uh, but this is a, pro a property that should hold in general for any point. Okay, so for example, in this case, in the ext this extreme case of uh, taking a, a uniform measure on the circle, we have two outlier processes, one inside and one outside, and despite the fact that they basically touch, uh, they are independent in the limit. Okay. Sort of this uh, wall of particles separates them. Uh, okay, some, some previously related results that I want to talk about. So, uh, Jan Kovitsky in a physics paper, he was a I think the first at least that I know that introduced this kind of a weak confining system, he, he considered these two uh, systems and some others. What he was interested in is actually in this uh, zoom in. He was interested in what caused the interface, what happens when you zoom in uh, around the a singular component here or around the boundary here. Uh, of course, uh, here you need to be careful because uh, here the typical separation is a one over n, the number of particles, and here the separation is one over square root of n. So you need to do the scaling appropriately. Uh, I'll just mention something uh, which I don't fully understand that it, it seems to found out as the following. He found the following uh, function. Uh, this is a density, but you can also describe the process uh, in the interface uh, of, this is for the circle. Uh, and actually, there, there are similar results uh, by uh, Shirai and by Seo recent uh, for a result which are ne next to a hard wall. So this is if you want to have, uh, let's say, a, a particle system, but you say, uh, I don't want to have any particles uh, in this uh, uh, region, then all the particles leave this region and some of them form uh, exactly this kind of a singular uh, component outside this. Uh, uh, region uh, and it turns out that may maybe uh, here in this uh, system there is no hard wall but it may be what's uh, behind this phenomenon that I guess universal is the fact that these particles form a singular component in, the in this case and in the case of the hard wall so the, the, the profile uh, turns out to be the same okay, and this is not true for uh, let's say the profile here definitely depends on the fact that it's a weak confinement Uh, another result uh, from about 10 years ago by Sinclair and Yatselev, they consider a special case. Uh, they are were also interested in, in this zoom in. Uh, they consider you take uh, uh, just a nice curve in the plane. So it's a generalization of this case, but I don't think they were aware of this previous work. Uh, and you put the equilibrium measure uh, on this, uh, the classical equilibrium measure on this curve, and then you this is your background probability measure and you generate the system. Uh, they didn't study uh, outliers, but uh, it, it is a, a result. Uh, if, you, if you read what they write, uh, then, then it's what we, we are, uh, did follows from what they, in the special case follow from, from the result. And actually they can do more precise estimate uh, close uh, doing this uh, zoom in around the boundary. Um, another question, which is uh, is like saying what's uh, what for this you need to be a bit uh, careful. How do you set the question? So uh, what's the what can you say about uh, the number of outliers? Maybe here I can move to the other side. Um, so first of all, the, uh, the, the, there is the question of what is an outlier, really, because. For if we fix n, then it's not really clear uh, what is an outlier. Uh, but one way to think about it is like this. So if the, let's say that this is the, if we look at the disk, and then uh, we have in the bulk the typical uh, distance between points is uh, like uh, one over square root of n. And so definitely we need to go at least this distance for something to be called an outlier. Um, it turns out that even if you look at the Gini ensemble, where you can do all kinds of calculations, uh, the points uh, will uh, tend, will, will go as far as square root of log n 
over n. This is the farthest that they can get with a reasonable probability. Um, so the difference here is the following that for a, an outlier, in, here I uh, phrase the result. So if, if we are at this distance, uh, we will not be able to, uh, to tell uh, the difference in terms of particles. There will still be many particles even for the strongly confined systems. Uh, but once we are above this scale, so uh, let's say just to be uh, less precise, let's say if we are going to a distance of uh, epsilon minus one half um, from the boundary, then uh, for uh, strongly confined systems, we will no longer find any particles. Uh, but for weakly confined systems, there will still be uh, something like n to the one half minus delta particles over the, okay? So there will still be many uh, particles. Once we, are at the well, once we are at a fixed distance from the boundary, we will only have a, a fixed number of points. Okay. Um, what's uh, interesting is that this sort of uh, universality is sort of a big word, but uh, there is some kind of universality, universality here and that the same phenomena uh, is uh, also, we see it uh, or completely different uh, particle systems where we consider now uh, zeros of the random polynomials. Uh, unfortunately, here uh, we can say uh, not so much. We, we, we can say something about a particular case situation. Uh, so I, uh, we consider a specific model that was introduced uh, uh, some time ago by Ofer Zissouni and uh, Steve Zeldich. Um, Mu is again a probability measure. Uh, this is a special case of uh, the model that they considered. So we have the logarithmic potential uh, by uh, introduced with measure and we introduce this uh, inner product between uh, polynomials. And we can uh, take the orthogonal polynomials. This depends on n. Uh, and define a, a random a polynomial by just taking this uh, psi L, this uh, standard complex Gaussians and taking a linear combination of the orthogonal polynomial. Okay, a, a canonical choice here would be to choose a uniform probability measure on the circle, and then we get the Katz polynomials, which are exactly a truncation of this uh, uh, Taylor series. So uh, now at least we, expect, we, we know what to expect. Um, so it turns out that the distribution actually only depends. So here we chose a specific uh, orthogonal polynomials, but the distribution only depends on the inner product. And then we have uh, some zero process, uh, which you know about psi n. And it, uh, it, this is known that it converges to this uh, probability measure that we started with. Okay. And what we can uh, show is that uh, if we take a very specific uh, measure, uh, we take an analytic curve and we take uh, some uh, density, which is uh, analytic, real analytic and strictly positive, uh, then we have two components naturally, one inside the curve and one is outside, it's a simple closed analytic curve. And the two components converge as a, the, if we look at the outlier process in each of the components, it will converge uh, in the limit to, to these two uh, Bergman point process. So it's exactly the same kind of uh, behavior. Um, so again, in the radial case, if you, if you look, uh, then it seems like this should work for much, much more general measures. They don't have to be supported on a curve or anything, but this is what we know how to prove so far. And in the, for us, what was important to, was to show that this is a kind of a general phenomenon. It doesn't depend on the fact that it's a Coulomb system. It also holds for the, this uh, general uh, other type of uh, weakly confined loss. Um, so maybe here uh, I will just uh, skip the details of the, of the multiply connected uh, domain. Uh, the, the important uh, message of what we found is that if you look at the simply, con at, uh, simply connected domain, then you choose the kappa n equals n plus one, then you just get a limiting process. But if you choose a, a non-simply connected domain, then in general, you don't have a limiting process. Uh, but what you can do is you can, you can choose the subsequences of n, uh, and along these different subsequences, we can describe the processes, all the processes you, that you can get in the limit. And it turns out that they are also background processes, but now they have a weight. 
Uh, unfortunately, we don't have, the, have yet a sort of a canonical way to uh, describe the spread, but we can uh, describe it in a sort of a, a explicit way uh, for, a, for a given uh, uh, simply uh, connected uh, domain. And again, the, the important thing for us here is that the limit uh, doesn't depend on the, on the measure, just on the, on the shape basically of the, uh, of the domain. Here there is uh, some, uh, there is some dependence on the measure through just the mass that it gives to the, uh, to the components. Let me skip this. Um, so I'll talk quickly about uh, how the, the proof uh, goes. Um, so in general, everything relies on, we have the kernels for the finite systems. We have the kernel of the limiting system, the Bergman kernel. We show, want to show a local uniform convergence. Okay. Um, so a key here would be, so there would be, uh, to, is that we can work on the diagonal. That's, uh, that's uh, the key to the whole uh, business where on the diagonal we get uh, just uh, uh, numbers, positive numbers, and we can just uh, get upper bounds and lower bounds to show convergence. Uh, so in one direction, we have this uh, crucial uh, upper bounds that the uh, finite processes are always dominated by the limiting process. And this is, for example, where we are, what's limiting us in the, in the uh, result for polynomials where this uh, inequality is not hold, does not hold in general. Um, now, because uh, of the kernels, we can, we can uh, play with the kernels a bit to make them analytic. Uh, as I mentioned, the, there is no uniqueness for the kernels, so we can modify them a, a bit to make them uh, suitable to the analysis that we want to make. And we, we can, from this, deduce the pre-compactness uh, to the family, and uh, basically uh, we can uh, just uh, uh, reduce everything to a lower bound. Uh, results that we need to do. Uh, so for the lower bound, uh, actually we need to construct uh, polynomials uh, that will sort of approximate the, the Bergman kernel. And this is, a, so we do it in a somewhat non-standard way. We don't find the actual uh, standard orthogonal polynomials, but we make some ad hoc uh, construction. Um, so the, the, in the short uh, word, uh, the, the difference between simply connected domain and multiply connected domain is that uh, we, we need to, uh, uh, to uh, move. We have the, uh, this external field, which we want to make uh, into a, an analytic function. And the way to do it in a simply connected domain is to have, uh, we have an harmonic function. We can find the conjugate function in this way, construct an, uh, an analytic function and in multiply connected domain, we cannot do this in general. So we need to add uh, some correcting factor. Uh, and this correcting factor is exactly uh, the thing which uh, uh, makes this thing uh, uh, depending on, uh, on the subsequent and so on. In general, uh, this doesn't work uh, for, uh, for any sequence that you take in. Uh, so that's, that's what happens in multiply connected domain. Uh, but so, but let's just talk a bit about the the easier case where we where we don't have any uh, where omega is simply connected. We don't have this comp uh, um, complications. Then in this case, we can actually modify the kernel to make it analytic, um, and this is also true for the for the Bergman kernel. Uh, so here we use the fact in a strong sense that uh, the uh, that's the important thing that we have. Uh, our original measure. Uh, we are looking at uh, the measure was supported, let's say here. That was mu. Uh, and we are looking at the outlier process here in the complement of its support. Uh, so the logarithmic potential is harmonic uh, there. If it's uh, simply connected, this complement of the disk, then we can uh, find the conjugate harmonic and make it analytic. Uh, and this is the, the idea behind making this uh, kernel uh, analytic. 
Uh, and then using uh, some uh, standard uh, results of uh, writing uh, the extremal, uh, there is a way to uh, describe the kernels in terms of uh, the supremo over uh, uh, appropriate class of functions. This leads automatically to comparison between the kernels. Uh, and then we can use the Montel's theorem uh, to get uh, the pre-compactness of the, this family of a uh, function. So here it's important to use uh, the fact that the, that they are uh, analytic and Z and anti-analytic in the second variable. Uh, so I'll skip this, but uh, like I said, in the multiple, uh, multiply connected uh, case, uh, it's no, no longer, we can no longer always find a conjugate harmonic function. So this has two complications. Uh, now for the lower bound, uh, the idea is the following. Uh, uh, we find uh, we have this uh, space uh, of analytic functions uh, with the uh, finite L2 norm in omega, uh, which uh, the auto or autonomous basis for this uh, uh, space uh, gives us the Bellman kernel that we want to have in the limit. And we, we choose a specific autonomous uh, uh, basis, uh, which is suitable for our needs. And then we can uh, construct polynomials, uh, autonomous polynomials with respect to the weight that we, which is relevant to us um, in such a way that they will converge to the autonomous basis. Uh, and in this case, in this way, we can, uh, this expression here uh, that we have is just the uh, expression that we have for the kernel on the diagonal for the, for the process. And because of the convergence, uh, we, this will give us a lower bound for the, uh, for, the, for the kernel of the process here. Notice that so the, this makes the analysis a bit uh, uh, more reasonable that we don't do any scaling here, okay? So usually uh, when you do things in random matrices, for example, you, you scale here the z's, uh, which means you need very delicate estimate for the kernel, but here we just take the kernel as is outside of the uh, of the bulk uh, and it's automatically have uh, we, we get the lower bound that uh, in the limit when l uh, not here tends to infinity we get a, a low as a lower bound the bell and um, so may, let me skip the details uh, it's a uh, non-trivial uh, uh, just say that uh, we use the ideas of uh, Hedenman and Wenman that uh, studied uh, uh, orthogonal polynomials uh, in the plane. Uh, so using a D-bar method, uh, we use a slightly uh, more uh, uh, relaxed version of what they do. And I'll just say a word about the uh, random polynomials. So the, they are the important uh, part here that they, they are not determinant point process. So we have to use a different approach. Uh, instead of the kernels that uh, works for determinant processes, we have the covariance kernels because the we have the random polynomials and they are uh, actually a, a, a Gaussian process. Uh, so we work directly with the covariance kernels of this Gaussian process. And we show that it converges to a correct limit, which is in this case is the, the Sego kernel. And from this, we deduce uh, that we see uh, something similar to the zeros of uh, that uh, analytic function. Um, so the idea is the, there are some similarity here. We can modify the kernel, uh, and using this, uh, we can uh, we can uh, find uh, the the limiting kernel that we are interested in. Um, so uh, the the problem here is that uh, uh, this initial result, which was uh, sort of uh, given to us by the extremal characterization of this kernel, since the uh, in the Bergman case, it's not no longer true for the Stegel case. So uh, here it only works in the restricted case where the measure is uh, supported on a uh, supported uh, on a curve. Okay. Uh, so here uh, we need to look for a different way if we want to generalize the results uh, to, to more uh, bigger. Uh, Action. Okay, so that's uh, the summary. Uh, so I talked about two types of weakly confined particle systems that they have uh, many outliers, uh, line of forms of a droplet. It turns out that the, there is a limiting point process 
at least in the case uh, of simply connected uh, components, uh, it is the same uh, determinantal process, uh, the Bergman point process. Uh, it does not depend on the initial properties of the measure, and it's conformal invariant. So it's uh, the same. So it, it transforms well between different shapes. Uh, okay, so this is all I want to say. Thank you. Okay, so, so are there any questions or comments? So, so in the previous slide, you showed that uh, some ex bound on expectation of the number of outliers. So I think the lower bound was square root n and the upper bound on square root n log n is something. This one? Yeah. So, so, here, so here, do we expect to have, uh, so, so do we expect the bound to be tight? I think the, here I'm not 100% sure, but based on some examples that I, more carefully, I think the lower bound should be correct. And I think something like this, like I said uh, over there, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you can see the difference. Uh, I don't know what an accurate result would be, but something like uh, if you uh, look at this distance, uh, you will start to have uh, no, uh, no uh, points for the strongly confined, and you will have something like if I'm not mistaken, it's something like this uh, points in the in the weekly confined. So we have still many, many points in the weekly confined. Um, yeah, I hope this will be part of the, of the more updated version. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, Elliot. Uh, yeah, so I think I have a question. Um, I mean, I guess you, you can cook up examples uh, where it's uh, uniform on the sphere or something like this. Is this what you mean? Um, but then all of them are outliers. That I guess the question is what. Uh, it could still be universality. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't, didn't think about it. Uh, And definitely cook up examples on the sphere, but uh, I'm not sure exactly what will be the. Because if you cook it up on the sphere, then there will just be more and more points. So, so yeah, I'm not sure exactly. You know, I need to think how to uh, formulate it. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. So you took uh, the V to be equal to the potential everywhere, right? Suppose you take V to be equal to U mu on some domain larger than the support of mu. Mm -hmm. You still get outliers and or, or something. Maybe I'm not sure that I understand, but one, one thing you can do is something like this. Uh, I think I did, we, we haven't tried, so we have to call it. Um, so if, uh, let's try to. Uh, so you can take a potential, then you have uh, the, you want to make it weakly confined, and then you want to make it uh, strongly confining again. That's what you thought thinking yes. about. Yes. Um, and then the potential would be something like this, I'm going to infinity, of course, but something like this. Um, yeah, so one can speculate what will happen. One speculation that I guess we have is that you will get not uh, something like the multiply connected uh, situation that I talked about, that you will get a projection determinantal process on the, on the ring, uh, but uh, nothing is proved yet. Okay, so, so are there any more questions? Well, if not, let us thank Alan again. Thank you.